All right, so I want to go ahead and introduce our keynote speaker, Caleb Siema. Caleb currently serves as the chair for the CSI, CSA AI Security Initiative. Caleb served as the chief security officer at Robinhood, where he focused on keeping customers safe. Prior to Robinhood, he was the security CTO at Databricks, the leading data analytics and machine learning company where he built the security team from the ground up. Previously, he was a manager, managing VP at Capital One, where he spearheaded ma uh, many other security initiatives. Prior to Capital One, you did got the, a lot of stuff, did, man. Can we, can we, yeah, we can kill most of that, I'm sure. I can sum he, it up. He gave me this to read, which was quite a bit. <laughs> I can sum it up. It's like uh, prior to that, I was more entrepreneurial, so I did some cybersecurity companies. Um, All right. So look, I'll, I'll give you one. Founded SPI Dynamics, Blue, Bo Blue Box Security, which were both acquired by HP and Lookout. Um, he's an advisor, investor, board member. He's done a lot of stuff. A lot of Welcome stuff. Welcome to the stage. Thank you. All Thank right, you. Man, all you. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, so today. Uh, we're going to do a hopeful and optimistic AI security talk. Uh, won't that be uh, a nice change, right? Yes, I know. Even though I personally, although I'm giving this presentation, I am kind of sick and tired of AI. But uh, let's go into uh, first, before, like, we're going to give some predictions a little bit here on how AI will solve the top CISO challenges. So we're going to run into that, but before we can do that, we have to set up some fundamentals. So what we want to do is get you a little bit of a base foundation for what we're going to talk about. So first and foremost, what are some of AI's strengths and their limitations? Now, what's really interesting about this is that before LLMs really came out, and that's what I'm really talking about when I say AI, by the way, is LLMs, generative AI, um, is most people thought, hey, being creative having reasoning skills, great communication skills, the ability to paint, create music, the arts, would be the last thing that AI would ever be able to accomplish. And oddly enough, it became the first thing out of the gate that it's quite good at, um, which is really sort of a fascinating aspect to it. The challenges or the limitations of AI, of course, if many of you who have used ChatGPT or Claude or any of the other chatbots that you've used in AI, is it can be challenging in both sort of its accuracy, its repeatability, and its non-determinism. Um, I actually have sort of a quote in all of the work that I've pulled together in dealing with AI myself, where I basically feel like AI is like uh, talking to a genius 13-year-old, overconfident, with short attention span, and no street smarts. Um, this is exactly, if you've dealt with AI a lot, this is pretty much what it's like uh, working with it. Uh, which, by the way, gives some job opportunities for middle school teachers to be prompt engineers, because they'd probably be quite good at it. Um, OK, so let's dig in a little bit deeper into some of the AI fundamentals. Um, in order for us to understand how AI is going to change security, we have to look a little bit about how it works. So I'm going to do a, a simple analogy that is sort of explain it like I'm five around sort of mapping how we learn a new skill. So let's take something like you were at a security conference, cross-site scripting, for example. So you want to learn cross-site scripting. What is it? How does it work? Well, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to go on the, on the internet, you're going to look for the, the web, you're going to start reading articles, you may ask ChatGPT how it works. Uh, you're going to go through and learn everything you can about cross-site scripting. This goes into, into your short-term memory. You're learning, you're at the beginning stages, you think, oh, cross-site scripting is very much about you know, HTML and JavaScript, and you input something into a field, you get output on the others, you can manipulate the JavaScript to create vulnerabilities or pop-up boxes. This is what you're thinking in your short-term memory. It's very, very static, it's very simple, it's very distinct, very accurate, and then as you continue over the days, weeks, in learning more about cross-site scripting, you start seeing good articles, good references to it. You start storing that in your working memory. Oh, this article that I read about cross-site scripting was really good around this angle and about that angle. And, this, and you start storing references in your working memory. This article was good. Oh, I remember this about this example and this hack that was done. And you start using working memory, which is a little bit more longer term. You don't store everything about the article, but you store the references to the article. 
And then as you go over months and months, and let's say years and years of going through working memory, you start developing a specialized skill set, a knowledge around cross-site scripting. And let's say after a year or two, you might be standing up on this stage giving a presentation about cross-site scripting, about the unique ways of being able to do things. You're so good at it that you can stand up, look at a website, and those of you who are AppSec people, you, can, you have an intuitive skill of, oh, I'm looking at a web application, I can tell this is probably cross-site scriptable, right? You get a feeling. And what's interesting is as we're going through this process, the more and more pattern recognition, the more and more you learn, the more and more abstract that you get out of what cross-site scripting is. And eventually when you become an expert at cross-site scripting, all of a sudden you look at cross-site scripting as, oh, it's not just about JavaScript or HTML. It's about there's an input and there's an output somewhere, and you, can you manipulate that? And you can look at different tech stacks and recognize how this works. You become really abstract. And then if you do it for many years, like I've been doing security for 25 years in my career, then it becomes part of your foundational knowledge, which is it's just from your gut. I, can, I now don't call it cross-site scripting. Cross-site scripting is now abstracted to me to it's a control plane problem and a data plane problem, right? Not even called cross-site scripting anymore. So you, you, as you get better and better and better, you start abstracting and abstracting becomes more about pattern recognition. So then when LLMs came out, you can look at it immediately and look at an entirely different tech stack and go, oh, prompt injection is basically cross-site scripting. Right? This is how you kind of learn, again, in a very simple manner, of taking it from short-term memory all the way to foundational knowledge where you have this instinct. Okay, so Caleb, you're like, what, what does that have anything to do with AI? Well, AI, or LLMs today, happen to work in a very similar fashion. So for example, many of you, if you use uh, ChatGPT or others, have heard about context windows. Context windows is the amount of text at which you can place in your chat and it will remember immediately and with high accuracy what you've posted in your prompt. That's basically your prompt. Your prompt and the response to your prompt is your context window. This is the equivalent of short-term memory for an LLM. There's also a working memory that enterprises and others are starting to use, which is called RAG, or Retrieval Augmented Generation, which is effectively a vector database that you start storing things into that expands that context window into a little bit of a larger, more permanent storage. And then there's this specialized skill set that we talked about. Well, what enterprises or what companies doing is they call this fine tuning. They take an open weights model, they then take data that, or skill sets or things they want to recognize, and they fine tune this model so that it doesn't take up the short term or context window memory, and they fine tune it. And then there's the foundational model itself. This is the things that these open weight models, Llama 3, or you know, even commercial models, you know, Anthropic, OpenAI use, that they spend billions and billions of dollars training. These are the core AI foundations. Now, what's interesting about this is that the, the process that I talked about that we as humans go, which is we can move data from short-term memory to working memory to specialized knowledge to foundational knowledge over periods of time. And we can learn how to make that transgression or that, or that movement happen. But in LLMs today, that is not the case. All of these things are very distinct, very manual pieces of work. So for example, a context window cannot immediately get moved into a RAG. RAG doesn't immediately get fine-tuned into a model. And definitely there's no such thing as fine-tuning and putting it into a foundational model. These things take huge amounts of time, are very manual and very distinct. So why is this important? Well, in order of us, for us to predict what AI is going to do to security, you have to predict what AI is itself is going to do. And in AI, you have to understand the goal is for it to start learning on its own. So if you start thinking about, well, how do you get to things like constant fine tuning or the ability for this thing to learn, all you have to do is look at these stages. Is there a way to automate the data going into context, going into RAG, going into fine tuning? And this is some of the goals that are happening today. So, now you've got some basics and some fundamentals about AI and where it works. Let's do a little bit of AI prediction. And it's not really prediction, <laughs> which is why I'm calling this what is here today but is coming tomorrow. Um, 
a lot of the things that I'm gonna talk about in this slide are actually present today, they're just not widely disseminated. So they're here, they're working in many ways, but they're just not broadly out to the public. So let's talk about some of those. First, expanded context windows. So remember I talked to you about the short-term memory? That short-term memory, you really need to expand that out because right now we're dealing with effectively what is 64K of RAM, right? What we really want is 16 gig of RAM. Why is this important? This is important because today LLMs have a hard time dealing with real-time data. If you can start making LLMs process real-time data, as an example, what if I just wanna shove a gig of log data into an LLM and have it make a decision about something? You need really large context windows. <clears throat> then it goes into continuous self-improvement. This is where I was talking about previously. How does it just consistently learn? So for example, if I have a large context window and I have an LLM and it's AI, the AI's job is just look at log data. So I'm feeding it gigs and gigs of log data saying your job is to get thoughts and reasonings about attacks out of this log data. And if that's all it's doing, then it should learn over a period of time, hey, like this is my job, this is what I'm specialized at, I'm gonna start moving my short context window into working memory, into specialized skill, to into foundational memory. So that, that my job as I'm learning it and continuously doing it is all about looking at logs. And so that is going to start happening. We wanna start seeing LMs go down this direction. I know I'm only looking at logs. I have processed this millions of times. It's time to start moving this into fine tuning myself for this job. Three, localized intelligence. Models are getting smaller and cheaper every day. You, if you watch anything about the news, you'll see Apple is clearly moving down the direction where LLMs and models and AI are gonna be embedded in every one of your phones, devices, watches, microwaves, TVs, series, Alexas. Like, this is where models are going. You, they, they are taking things that are both 70 billion parameter models, finding that they can achieve 80% efficiency at a 7 billion parameter model size, which means it can run very, it's on smaller devices on your local laptop. Um, hardware is getting cheaper, hardware is getting faster. I'll give you a great example of this. Like, we've, we're starting to see this, and when you start seeing this in enterprises, it's not just devices, it's you should start seeing AI models running on compute power, in containers, in serverless functions. All of a sudden we start thinking, oh wait a minute, if an AI model is in every container in my production environment, what does that mean? What can you do with that? Fourth, uh, LLMs and AI is gonna start becoming, making decisions and acting. You're already seeing that happen today. Uh, Anthropic, Claude, Google, everyone is creating agents. These are things that are effectively like, give an AI a toolkit, say slash user bin, here AI, and you have root access, go do something with it. Now I know what all of you are thinking, because this is a security conference, oh my God. <laughs> Don't do that. Um, but you know, keep it in check, this is about what is, ha what is happening, and you know, how you secure those things is an entirely different talk. But that is what's happening. You're opening up AI to the internet, you're opening up AI to your machines, and you're giving it toolkits, and you're saying I want you to make decisions and I want you to act. This is where things get really interesting and powerful in AI. And finally, low cost and high performing. I mentioned this before, chips are getting cheaper and cheaper when it comes to these smaller models, and they're becoming very high performing. Let me give you an example. Today, um, when, you, uh, when you go and you chat on ChatGPT, you know how everything sort of writes out like a typewriter, like you see it kind of go across the screen? This is the performance of the LLM giving you its response. Um, today, the, there are specialized chip companies that are doing this at 600 tokens per second versus what you experience as a consumer is probably more around like the 20 tokens per second, right? However, what's coming out next year is gonna be chips that are making, are running at 100,000 tokens per second, which is absolutely mind blowing. So then you're thinking, okay, now you can get instantaneous responses from LMs. Well, what does that mean? Well, you know one of the biggest things that holds back robots and robotics from using LMs is its response time, its cost, it's the way that, it, how fast it responds. When you're doing 100,000 tokens per second at cheaper cost, all of a sudden robotics can become almost instantaneous in its actions. Uh, this, it becomes really fascinating. So all of these things are actually here today. 
<clears throat> but coming tomorrow. Um, these are the kinds of things that now set the precedence to say, this is where AI is going. What does that now, how is that going to change us in the enterprise? So, and again, before we get to security, we have to look at AI's impact in our company. Uh, because obviously in security, we run on top of our company. So first, I'm gonna make a couple predictions. Um, in our organizations, all meetings and communication will be analyzed and searchable. I've been using an AI note taker for the past six months and it is phenomenal. Um, and it is amazing, it is a no-brainer that every enterprise will start taking all of its meetings, recording it, having AI take its notes, and these things will be out and searchable. And yes, I know the security red bells are like flagging all over the place. Privacy, yes, I get it, <laughs> it's going off. However, this is going to happen. And by the way, it's phenomenal because a lot of times companies and enterprises run off meetings and though that data is always lost. Yet now when that data is retained in a great way, this can be used to help us and I'll show you that in a little bit. Documentation and wikis. These things are always static. Wikis are great. You go in an enterprise, you search for what your team does, except no one ever updates it. It's always out of date. No one ever does anything with it. LLMs are gonna be phenomenal at self-updating documentation. My prediction is, as we move forward in the future, you're gonna see wikis that will just self-update. You can create your things, all the data will automatically update. LLMs are phenomenal at being able to communicate, synthesize information, and then update it. Uh, automated management status reports. Man, now that is a phenomenal thing. <laughs> like if you look just in a security team or in a company overall, 20 to 25% minimum of your team's time is being spent writing reports for you to look at or a manager to look at to say, yes, I think we're doing something here. That is an immense waste of time. Um, I think AI will help solve a lot of that. And finally, local agents or oracles. You're already seeing this happen. Take, say, AWS. AWS is already working and it has created its local AI oracle, which means it understands the way AWS works, it understands its functions, what, what is needed, what is not needed, and you can go and say, hey, I just need to know how to get the right permissions to change from this container to talk to this container. It will automatically know your environment, automatically tell you what it is, tell you the rules, tell you the roles, everything you need to know, you can just query and you'll get that information. That is already happening. But think about that across all your SaaS apps. Salesforce, think about that in Google Apps. Think about this in Jira. All of this is now happening today. So you can just query these oracles and get the information you need versus having to go and search. Finally, how is it going to impact engineering? Because as you know, in security, engineering is your closest uh, and the thing at which you're most dependent upon. Code and cloud will become self-documenting. Already today, AI is better at doing code documentation than engineers are. Um, it can go in every function and say, this is what it does and here's how it works. You keep abstracting that up from classes to programs to the way it works. You can, as people will code, it will automatically document what the code is doing and how it works. Um, requirements will become really important because what we're seeing is AI is good at generating small code blocks and snippets that are great and it can help automate, because we all know this, engineering and coding is just putting Lego blocks together. If you've got the right Lego blocks, can AI help put all those together? Yes, and then what becomes important is how you write your requirements. And then if you can write your requirements really well, it will auto-generate and compile these blocks together. And then testing, which has been the biggest bane of our existence in enterprise, is no one even tests anything. Uh, testing is today very static, very breakable, very fragile. Versus now, and I think an AI can look at how a program works, automatically write test cases, and it will become fluid and dynamic to where testing can become way easier. And finally, uh, I talked a little bit about this, but these localized models will sit in production environments. So think about it this way. Now, when you go and you look at your production environment, if there's a localized model in every production instance, it will automatically determine health, determine, hey, this thing is not working right, we can just automatically restart it. Which, by the way, 50% of any incident response in, in engineering is about restarting a system. Um, these models will understand it, know it, take actions on it, and then be able to do these things automatically. Uh, 
This, by the way, if you're a security person, wow, this becomes really scary. Um, but fascinating. Okay, great. Now I've given you the basics. Uh, AI fundamentals, some predictions about AI, a little bit about its impact in the enterprise. Now let's get to the actual security part. Um, okay, so this is about the CISO's top challenges. Now, as when I became a CISO, I have to tell you, like I used to be, in my prior life, I was a vendor. And I, the number one question I would always ask every CISO is tell me your top problems so I can go create a product to sell it to you so that you can buy it. <laughs> and then now as a CISO, the number one question I get from everyone is what are your top problems? Give me your top problems. They always ask it over and over and again. So what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna give you the answer to the CISO's top challenges. What's gonna be amazing about this is this was the same answer five years ago as it's going to be five years from today. It never changes. Are you ready? So if you ever wanted to know the CISO's top challenges, take your, take your camera out, take your photo, because this will always be that problem. Here we go. Here's the problem. Reporting, talent, relationships, budget, and management. <laughs> These are the CISO's top challenges. And you're like, well, wait a minute, that's not any different than any other manager. Yep, that's pretty much spot on. And in fact, as a CISO, like 99% of your job has nothing to do with cybersecurity at all. It is all about management and talent and reporting and budget. Um, now, of course, this is a more technical conference. We, this can't be the problem set I'm gonna talk about. Um, what we really want to talk about is the CISO's top security challenges. Uh, so I've listed them here. So actually, this is these challenges, which are reporting, which you'll see is the same, by the way, vulnerability management, least privilege, compliance and measurement, third-party incident management, and detection and response. Now, these are not six top issues I just put here just because I thought these were the top issues. I actually interviewed 40 different CISOs to come up with this list. Uh, just this year, I came up with this list. 40 CISOs, this is what the list came out to. Now, what's also interesting about this is if I had shown you the top six issues five years ago, this would largely also be the same. Maybe third-party incident management may not have been there, least privilege may not have been in the top, but they're always in the top 10, and everything kind of moves, but vulnerable management, definitely, compliance and measurement, uh, detection and response, reporting, these have always been in the top five, period, five years ago, 10 years ago, today. And so that begs the question, which is, there are billions and billions of dollars of investment in security vendors and products to solve these issues, why are they the same problems? Is it because that the vendors aren't making great products? No, that's not true. Actually, it's because there's an underlying fundamental issue as to why technology cannot solve these problems. And so if you dig one layer deeper than what this, these sets of issues are, you're gonna get these sort of, what I'm gonna call these three fundamental issues that are underlying this, that I think is the real problem why we cannot make real fundamental changes here. And those three problems is, I call them the three C's. Coverage, context, and communication. Um, these three things is this underlying fabric that Un, that, is, that is underneath these things that I think is what really we're trying to get to that we cannot. So let's dig into that. So let's go with context first. Context is the who, what, where, why, and how. This is, and by the way, this is what every single question comes into play. So let's give some examples of this. When you're in vulnerability management, you get a critical issue that pops up in a report. The, you don't immediately say, oh, that's critical. That's not what your team does. That's not what you do. The first thing you go is you say, well, is it exploitable? Is it exploitable by whom? An inside attacker? An external attacker? What environment it is in? What system is it on? Is it an important system? Is it just a throwaway system? Is it even ours or is it someone else's? This is all context. Can I fix it right away? Or is it like really a priority? Here's the things that people don't really understand is when you report a critical vulnerability by a product, it's all this context that every single vulnerability has to be reviewed by and triaged to say, do I fix this or do I not fix this or when do I fix this? This context happens every single time. It is in the iceberg, it is the underlying thing under the water that no one really understands. So let's give a real life example of this. Um, Let's talk about 
S3 buckets. <laughs> I picked this because I know every single one of you has experienced a problem with an S3 bucket. Um, so let me tell you a real story that happened. Um, so we got a report in, a critical alert that said, hey, you have a public S3 bucket that's open. So the first thing you do is, wait, well, how do you, why is that critical? Um, well, first of all, like what's in the bucket, right? Number two, do we even own the bucket is probably a big key factor. And number four is like, is this bucket supposed to be public? Because we actually in our enterprise have a lot of buckets that are supposed to be public. So that's the first thing we do. We actually look at this and say, hey, uh, is, this is this bucket supposed to be public? Someone goes, I, I don't know, let me check the list. And then your next question is, well, where's that list stored? And then someone says, oh, in this Excel spreadsheet. Uh, and then you say, uh, how, when was the last time that was updated? I think it was updated a couple months ago, so I think it's up to date. Okay, well, let's look. Is it in the spreadsheet? No, it's not in the spreadsheet. Okay, so clearly, it's not a bucket that's supposed to be public. Okay, well, who owns it? Well, let's go to our CSPM. Let's figure it out. We search for it. No, that bucket's not even in our environment. Okay, well, then what do you got to do? Well, you have to go to infrastructure team. Ask the infrastructure team, do you guys know anything about this bucket? They're like, I've never heard of it. Then you search the Slack, Slacks, and you search Jira for the bucket name. Where is the bucket? Oh, you start, Slack starts appearing up. Oh, here is this bucket name. And then you find out that there's an engineer that has been talking about this bucket. And you're like, okay, this is like, what is going on here? What you're doing is you're trying to figure out where the bucket is, what the context is, to understand what's happening. And then you start saying, well, what's in this bucket? And you start going through that bucket and start identifying that, oh, wait a minute, there are really critical issues. There is PII in this thing, which by the way, there was. There is a bunch of interesting issues in here. Now this turns from a vulnerability into an incident. Uh, and now we start having to figure out what's going on. This is all about context. So you can see how one thing needs a lot of different data in order to answer. So let's go into the second, coverage. Coverage by far I think is, and I'm going to just stick my finger in the air and make the statement, there's no real data behind it, but I think 99% of most breaches are probably by coverage problem. Um, coverage is the width and the depth. It's not about do we have controls for it, it's do we, does it cover everything it needs to, right? It's not like, for example, well, I'll go into examples. It's also about depth. So let's take an exa a look at coverage with this S3 bucket problem. So, for example, in that S3 bucket, when we started digging into it on a width perspective, we're like, why did we not see this S3 bucket, which clearly has customer data? Well, when we actually asked and looked in the slacks, we ended up identifying that an engineer, a senior engineer, had set this bucket up as a partnership bucket with one of our partners. And it was initially meant to be a test bucket to test the communication sharing of data between us and our partners. However, as we all know, what ended up happening is they ended up using it as a test, it became production, and then over time, they just started using this as what it is. So then the next question is, well, how did this bypass our controls? We have SCP on there. In order to have a public bucket, you must submit a ticket in order for us to approve a public bucket. Well, actually, that exact reason is what caused this engineer to use his corporate credit card and another AWS account, created that AWS account just to test the bucket because he was like, well, hey, that's too much work. Because by the time security's response times comes around, like that's too much of a pain. So this is then how this bucket ended up becoming part of this. Oh, okay, this is the width coverage problem, right? Which by the way, Various different reasons for why that's, why that's a problem. But again, coverage. We did not see that. That was out of our scope. This is the kind of thing that happened every day. And then you start looking at depth. Well, when we started going through this bucket, which, by the way, was very big, we actually identified a whole bunch of secret keys, and an engineer had accidentally uploaded their entire home directory into this bucket. This is real, by the way. This is like real. I'm talking about real cases. And in that were a bunch of keys. Now, all of a sudden, well, by the way, since we had no control over this bucket, do we know if these keys were accessed or not accessed by someone not external to our environment? We have no idea. So what do you have to do now? You have to rotate every single key that was in that. This is a depth problem. Who goes through every single S3 bucket object? That is a depth issue. Again, coverage, it's all about 
coverage. What if we didn't go through every object? Then we never would have known. Then all of our keys would have been leaked and no one would have known about it. And then someone could have used that and then attacked us later. Okay, coverage, by the way, is my favorite topic. There's so many different examples. Take something like account takeovers. Account takeovers, you put a policy that says, I mandate all employees must have 2FA on all accounts. That's my mandate. Okay, great. The security team goes out. We mandate that in our company. 2FA is on everything. But yet, we actually have an incident where someone broke into one of our SaaS apps and then actually changed something, and we identified this incident. What happened? It was an account takeover. Well, wait a minute. How is it an account takeover when everything has 2FA? Well, actually, what we found out is we have contractors who we contract with who the 2FA policy got exempted for. Why did it get exempted for? Oh, well, because it had this specialized thing that we had to go do, and that contractor had credentials that were breached elsewhere. They credential stuffed them, got in, got into our systems that way. Coverage, great example. Number two, missing logs. If you've ever had an incident, by the way, and I know this has happened to all of you, you're in incident response mode. You're going through trying to figure out what's going on. What did the attacker see? What customer data did they touch? All of a sudden, you go in incident and you start finding out, hey, what did the attacker touch? We don't know. Why? Because we don't have logs from that. Well, what about over there? Do you have logs from that? No, we don't. We did have logs, but for some reason, we stopped getting them three months ago. Why did we stop getting them? I don't know. We're trying to troubleshoot that. It's, well, what about that log? Like, what are, are we getting these logs? Yes, we're getting those logs, but it's not giving us the information we need. Like, let me give you a great example. There, is a, there was a very, very big provider that would give you audit logs of logins, but they would never give you a success login. So they would only tell you failed logins, but no successful logins. And then you're like, well, then how do you determine if someone's successful at a brute force attempt? You can't. <laughs> this is a coverage problem, right? Uh, and there's so many of these, and I'm going to do just the last one. Thousands of, and by the way, if all of you who are in security teams, I know for a fact this exists because it exists in our, in my area. In your vulnerability management program, you have thousands of mediums, if not millions of mediums and lows that no one will ever look at and ever triage, even though we know that most security incidents are about combinations of lows and mediums that equate into a critical breach. It doesn't matter. We don't have the time, resources, or capability to triage all of those. A depth problem. Same thing for your detection and response. All those alerts that come in, you don't have time. It's a depth problem. OK. Last one, communication. This is the most important one out of these three and is also the biggest waste of time. <laughs> communication. Well, why do I say that? <laughs> I say that because here are some examples uh, that you're going to see in communication. How are we doing on our OKRs? Uh, when you, as a leader, say this to your team, what does your team have to do? Your team has to go, OK, well, let me go ask the people on the ground what they're doing. Hey, you need to submit a report. What did you write on your JIRA ticket? I need to spend all this time accumulating all of this data to give it to you to say, yeah, OK, this looks like we're doing things. <laughs> Like, or when you start doing things like, what is the risk of an asset? And then you start, when I ask that question to my team, hey, we have this, let's, let's call it this instance or this cluster over here. Uh, what's the actual risk of this cluster? Someone has to go and say, oh, well, out of all the security products that we have, uh, that's a big question. <laughs> like, I have to go to my CSPM, my cloud. I have to go to my DSPM, my data. I have to go to my ASPM, my application security product, gen reports, merge them together, because none of these security products actually talk to each other and give you an overall real risk. Everything is either cloud, data, machine, like app. Everything is its, its own little segments that when you ask one question about one asset, you got to like collect all of these things to sum it up to me for me to then sum that up to the board. Like everything, it takes all of this time reporting, 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 communicating. Same with like regulators, compliance people who ask you, their entire job is to basically ask you, are you doing the right thing? And you have to prove that you're doing the right thing, yet fundamentally you have to translate that to 15 different types of regulators, right? Like whether you patch something or not has to be communicated differently to HIPAA, to PCI, to whatever sort of compliance or regulatory that you've got to deal with is a different translation layer. Everything is about a translation layer. So those are the three problems. 
But this is where AI, I think, comes into play because AI actually excels in these three things. For example, coverage. Um, when you can think about these agents doing things, what would you have 10,000 smart junior security engineers do? I would absolutely have one of them watching every single bucket object right all the time. That's all your job is to do. Look at every single data right. Is it looks like a security thing? Is it a problem? Is it not? I would definitely have them looking at every single engineer or company Slack channel, watching and saying, does anything come up that's security related? Or watching the code base to determine, hey, did an engineer make a change to, say, the authentication function? Like, they should be watching and looking at every single thing around this, depth and width-wise. I want to look at every financial transaction. Does this thing look something like security related? Every design document, hey, it looks like the product team is creating a feature that looks like it might be security related. You may want to take a look at this. This is what now AI can give you. It can give you coverage, the ability to look at these things and make reason, decent, reasonable uh, decision, decision skills around what should be reported versus what is not. And, third to, and second to that, it can now communicate those things. So when you think about communication and you start thinking about reporting, it's phenomenal at synthesizing information. It's great at pulling together data and writing a summary or giving you updates on the status of what's going on. It's phenomenal at doing this. I can say, hey, I patched the system. Please write a report that applies this patching to PCI, to HIPAA, to whatever regulatory, and it will come up with the right wording. It will translate that for me very, very, very well. It can also communicate actively. For example, how many of you have remember chat ops? This was a thing that came like quite a while ago. Right? And now it can be done for real. If I get a detection that says, hey, this vulnerability appeared or this incident occurred, it can actually slack the engineer or find who the owner is and have a real conversation with that engineer about, hey, this is what we saw. Here's what's going on. Is there anything that you, why are you doing this? What's going on with it? And they can explain it. And then that AI can synthesize that information and even pragmatically return the answer to me in a proper way so that I can then take next automated actions off of this. Context, it's great at context because it can actively search, identify the things that you need and pull that information together. So for example, remember we were talking about recording all the meetings that happen? Well, if it knows, like in this S3 bucket example, I'm looking for this S3 bucket name. What is my team doing? They're searching Slacks, they're searching Jira, they're searching Confluence, they're searching email. Well, they could also search meetings, right? And then it says, hey, we did find this. Here are all the places we saw this. Here's the summary. This engineer did create this bucket at this time. Here's was his name. This is the reason why they created and who the partner was and how all that worked. And that can be done instantaneously. That is phenomenal context. So. Here's my, uh, my ask. I'm going to have you now take a journey with me of today versus tomorrow. So we're going to go through some real life examples of how this can apply. So let's take, for example, um, detection and least privilege. In my organization, I have egress. So that means any outbound call going to our network is blocked or is, let's say, just detected and reviewed because we know in our production environment exactly what should be going outbound, okay? So today, in my detection team, you're gonna see an alert that pops up and says, hey, a new outbound call to strike.com was identified. That's what you see today. Well, you think about that and you're like, well, okay. <laughs> is, is that a bad thing? Is that a good thing? Like, I don't really know what, what I should do with this. These are the kind, it's not a false positive. It's a real alert. It's just, what do I do with this alert? versus let's see what this might look like tomorrow. Here's what it looks like tomorrow. And I'm, I, I rarely read slides, but I'm gonna read these. Um, Strike.com was identified and is being allowed. Oh, interesting. This is expected behavior and is considered low risk for the following reasons. Stripe is a trusted provider and only outbound calls are allowed. Engineering documentation and discussions have identified Stripe being the new accepted payment provider. The Stripe libraries were introduced to the new code repo payment lib on this date. A discussion with Cosmo, who is the active contributor to payment.lib, occurred at 1.22 p.m. on this date via Slack to confirm the domain stripe.com is allowed outbound. Oh, wow. Now to an analyst, this is now enough context 
and information for them to say, yeah, this is right. Great, triage, move on to the next one. Let's take a look at an example of vulnerability management and coverage. Today, you're gonna get a vulnerability and it's gonna say, a cross-site scripting issue was identified in the internal customer service, uh, service system via the case commenting function. That's the kind of vulnerability alert you get today. And you're like, okay, great, is that critical? Is it not critical? Like, do I need to be worried about it? Is it internal only? What do I do with this? Versus tomorrow, here's what I should get. It was located at this URL, and the total exposure time was 22 minutes. Whoa, exposure time, that's interesting. I've never seen that. Well, tell me more about this. Well, at the, these are the timestamps. It says, this issue was identified be the nuclei assessment product. It was rated as low risk due to internal system, limited authenticated users required, and on a staging system. Wow, that is phenomenal. You can tell me what systems it is and tell me it's staging versus production, it's limited authenticated versus not. That is great. The issue was introduced in the last push to staging. The code that has the vulnerability was found to be introduced by Josh Smith. A fix with a PR was submitted, and Josh was notified of this fix via Slack. Josh has recognized this issue and accepted the PR. And at 3.53, a new rule was added to SEMGREP, and the requirement stock was modified for this type of issue. Done. All automated. Whoa. Oh, that's context. That's communication, right? Coverage. All of these things is the key to this. Okay. Crown jewel alert. Uh, I have, I, you know, in my strategy, I create crown jewel zones, right, around what is really important in my system versus what's not. Your requested approval settings are high for any crown jewel trust zones. A request for delete access for the role SP report gen on this S3 bucket, do you approve? This is a great simple example of user access requests. Do I approve this or not? This is what I see today. I have no idea whether I should approve this or not. Versus what should I get tomorrow? Context. The recommendation is to grant access for the following reasons. The request was made by Martin Bryce, who is a principal engineer of the data infra team, who is the owner of this asset. Oh, well, that makes a big difference. If he's the owner and he's requesting it, that probably makes a lot of sense. Meetings with Martin and the business media team discuss cleaning up discarded reports on a regular basis on this, on this date. Here is the summary of this conversation. Jira ticket 2928 was filed with a request for expanded permissions for regular cleanup activities. Requirements doc for SP report was added, added the delete capability, and we reached out to your head of security engineering, Werner Brandes, on Slack on 315, and he gives approval for this. Oh. That, okay, reading off of this, this is fantastic. I approve this request for delete permission. And finally, as a CISO, in my thing is about crown jewels and least privileges. And so the thing to me was one of my missions and one of my initiatives was on all of our crown jewels, I want a least privilege model to occur. And what I need is I just need to understand a couple things. I need to understand the amount of privileges on each crown jewel and how we've reduced those, those accounts and then how we've reduced those privileges. That's the thing that matters to me. So here's my, that's my OKR, that I need, those are my KPIs. Uh, for sure today, an LLM can easily get the data automated. We can, it can build the dashboard, and it can absolutely just do this completely without people's help. My team does not have to collect this data anymore. All it, it can say, these are your P0 crown jewels. This is the 72% reduction in account and 88% reduction in privileges. The last activities that were done on these accounts, on these crown jewels, were three accounts were removed from this data store on this date. Uh, one account was changed permission to read only for this data, data store. This is very, very simple data to synthesize, put in a dashboard without anybody's manual work. Um, this is sort of, again, communication. Uh, the ability to take the data, synthesize it, translate it for me, and then do it automatically. Very easily done with AI today. Okay, and that closes up my presentation. Um, I can do, I don't know if I have time for Q&A, but how much time do I have? 
15 minutes. Okay, so I can do Q&A if anyone has any questions. Yes? Uh, how do you see this impacting uh, role-based access, in, which is required for these privileges? I think that's a huge problem is having something tell me what the roles are to give these privileges. Yeah, I mean, I think, like, one thing is that we always know is that these things aren't going to go away. Rule-based is, is the way that it works. It, it absolutely does the job that it needs to. I think AI's job is to provide context around those rules. So, for example, why do I need to create a rule that says marketing can't access something, as a great example? Well, maybe certain people in marketing should or shouldn't. What's the context in me saying this person should or should not have that access in marketing? I think AI will do the job in helping provide the information and the context so that you can make that decision better, but you're still going to create the rule. However, in the future, depending on how much you trust AI and where it goes, will AI itself create the rule for you? Possibly, and most likely. Any other questions? Yes? Do you think, uh, let's call it AI, do you think that uh, we can use AI, leverage AI to be helpful to the data cataloging and labeling and all the standard data management stuff that right now is very manual and very contentious if you have different key players that say, this is my crown jewel, no, this is my crown jewel. So now you've got this potential three-legged stool of hell have your business risk, right? You've got security risk, and then you've got a potentially a um, public risk, right? Social media slash, I don't want to be in the front page of uh, Washington Post. Mm -hmm. Can AI help us with that governance process, which is often really complicated to navigate? Uh, by the way, can anyone hear his questions or should I repeat it? Okay, uh, if I could maybe sum this up is, your question is can AI really help in classification and data labeling? Uh, um, and maybe there's a second part of the question, which is even higher level of that, once, it, you, once you have classification and data labeling, can it help make sense of what is important in those things? Does that sum up your question? Yes, and you also have the different risk optics. So you have business risk. Business risk. Yeah, so, and also, now that I've got that, what is my lens, business risk, social media risk, security risk, those are all the, okay, so, phenomenal question. Um, first and foremost, one thing that I think just machine learning in general is quite good at, but I think LMs are even, uh, well, I, I, I might be getting kicked off. <laughs> <It's getting dark>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, clap on, is that, uh, um, uh, so first of all, like, let's take an example today. One of the biggest problems with things like classification of data or DLP is that, well, what is, what is sensitive and what is not sensitive, and what is sensitive to what group, right? For example, something like a press release may not be sensitive to engineering, but it's definitely sensitive, like, if we don't do a press release before it's going public, that's hugely sensitive to the organization as a whole. So then how do you classify these things? And today, that's been the biggest problem, is people have to go write rules, going back to the rule area, to say this data is either sensitive, not sensitive, has PII, doesn't have PII, who is it important to, who is it not important to, what type of data is it, period? Is it legal data, data financial data? Like, all of these are big questions. Um, this, by the way, LLMs today are phenomenal at this. In fact, it can do that extraordinarily well, from an email message to the files that you have on disk to just random text and non-structured data that you've got anywhere. The problem is cost and speed today. So for example, like why is not every single data file, every email being processed through an LM to help label and classify? It's a cost problem. It's a speed problem today. There is no way that I can pass all that data in and like I'll be spending millions and millions of dollars on doing this. And the speed and performance of this would not be great. The tech is there the actual cost and performance is not there. So what this does say for you is this will come. It's just a matter of time. Take two years, I already know that by the end of next year, these chips, they're doing 100,000 tokens per second at $40 per chip. Like you can now use these on Llama 3 baked in and you can then set up a system where I can shove every real time email that goes across through an LLM and get a classification answer. Uh, that, is, that is coming. 
Um, now, going back to your larger discussion around, well, then now, what is my business risk? What is my uh, you know, security risk or social risk? It, 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 again, technology exists for that. It's actually really great. The problem, by the, by the way, with most LLMs is it's all about your prompt today. Building the right prompt is key to everything. And if you can build the right prompt and pass it, again, context window, the right amount of data, it can say, this is, here is your social risk around the data you fed me versus the business risk, and it will give you a pretty phenomenal answer. But writing the right prompt is very hard. And so that has always been the difficulty in doing AI today. Uh, I think I, before you, I'll get you for, him first and then you. Yes. Yeah, so the question is about uh, you know, aggregation of data. Um, first, you know, sort of the integration of sensitive data into non-sensitive data, and now it being quote unquote accessible. Maybe that's, and if, and if I could maybe ask a follow-up, your worry here is a data leakage problem. Yes. Um, okay, there are several answers to this. Uh, first, I'm gonna start with the real controversial one, which is I think data leakage is super overhyped. Um, that's the, my controversial right answer. But let me sort of justify that and also give some exceptions uh, to this. Um, if you are using a foundational provider, like, and when I say foundational, I mean like more frontier, like OpenAI, Anthropic, uh, some of these guys. The, the, there's two things to kind of both realize here. Uh, one, the amount of effort put into cleaning data um, and putting it into their training model, which is their foundational model, um, is a huge amount of effort and cost. And secondary to that, even more important to that is, like, actually leaking data out of an LLM is extraordinarily difficult. Very, very hard. Um, if you, for, let me give you, again, some structure around this. Uh, first, in order for, and I'm just gonna take sensitive data, and I'm just gonna call it, so say something like a social security number. As an attacker, my job is I need to go extract a social security number out of an LLM. So there's a couple things that you need to be able to in order to do this. First, in the technology itself, that social security number has to be repeated enough times in the training data to have enough frequency for it to develop a pattern and an ability to pull that pattern out of an LLM. So number one, that social security number has to be in that, that training data in enough frequency for it to be pulled. Number two, I, as the attacker, have to know enough of that secret to have it finish the pattern. So as an example, I might know the pattern of a social security number, and let's say I need to know the first three digits and at least the fourth digit for it then to complete the rest of that social security number and give it to me in its answer. Number three, even if it does give it to me in its answer, I have to determine whether it's a hallucination or not. Um, this is very hard to do, very, very difficult at an LLM, purely LLM model. So I think data leakage in training data in an actual model, that being the only use case, data leakage is very difficult. Yes, there are instances where you can send things where you repeat to an LLM and it starts dumping training data. Yes, that has been uh, discovered. Yes, but that is basically it's like trying to take small snippets of RAM in a memory dump in a vast storage of the internet uh, of where this is. So actively extracting it is extraordinarily difficult. Now, now that I've said data leakage is not a priority, I will give exceptions to this. Most enterprises have to use things if you are doing something internal to your enterprise. Let's say you're using a foundational model and you are taking your corporate sensitive data and you are putting it in a RAG or a vector data store. Right? And in your vector data store, what you're gonna do is someone will request data, you'll do a search in your vector database, you'll pull that information out, you'll take your prompt and you'll shove that into an LLM and then it will synthesize that information and then pass it back to the customer. In this instance, this does data leakage is a huge problem because the vector database itself will pull very accurate, it's just like a regular database, very sensitive material if 
there is sensitive material in that vector database and it will return it and all the LLM is doing is spitting it back out, right? It has nothing to do with the LLM. The LLM is more an actor on the d data that it behaves on. Um, in that instance, prompt injection becomes real problems. Data leakage becomes a real problem. Um, then the question is, well, what is the enterprise doing about aggregation of that data, right? So you are either, you have to have your own data pipeline cleaning process that says, before I shove my data into a vector database, or even before I fine tune a model with that data, I need to have all of the work that frontier models have done or other people have done on cleaning and representing what is sensitive, what is not, and taking that information out before shoving it into a vector database or before fine tuning my model. So all that work has to be done by the enterprise in those scenarios. So hopefully that answered uh, that question. Okay, and I believe you were number two, yes. For middle school teachers? Yeah. Yes. What are some of the other roles that you see that will be coming forward in cybersecurity? You know, um, that is a really great question. And, uh, you know, to give you the real honest answer, uh, I don't know. I haven't thought too much about it. Um, but I will say this, like, um, one of the key things that I think in any new technology happens um, is I think there's two things that happen. First, everyone has this fear that it will remove your job um, and you won't have a job. A great example is cloud. Just look at cloud. Cloud first came out, huge fear, black box, don't touch cloud, oh my God, all these data center people, you know, no more jobs, and then like everything, like this is a big fear factor. Um, but I actually, what ended up happening is it created more jobs, right? you started creating you know, infrastructure teams and cloud teams, all these people to manage this complex thing that became the cloud. So more jobs actually got created out of that. I think, and, and cloud augments those people in doing I think AI is very similar. You're gonna see augmentation. Um, you're gonna see people using AI to augment what they do. They're gonna be very effective at it. And I think the more that we start seeing AI first built systems, which by the way, we haven't seen yet today. Today, AI is very duct taped on, very similar to like cloud. Cloud, we, if you remember in first cloud waves, we lifted and shifted. It's basically take my current infrastructure, pull it up, replicate it in cloud, now I'm a cloud company. Uh, you're seeing that in AI, which, oh, I'm a, I'm a software company, I plug chat GPT somewhere, I'm now an AI company. Um, however, we haven't seen cl like cloud first, when cloud first really happened, where companies created their infrastructure based on that. Um, AI, I think, is going to be similar. You're going to see, and see in the next couple of years people who are really building true AI first companies that are using the powers of AI in the right ways. And I think it will probably create new types of jobs similar to infrastructure. Um, but I don't know specifically around security teams and the kinds of jobs that will lay in them. Uh, yes, over here, I believe. Yeah, I mean, that is a valid threat. Oh, by the way, I'm, not, I'm forgetting to repeat the question. Uh, the question being, if I were to rephrase it, um, is um, in the data cleaning process, if a bad actor were in that process, what now, yeah. right? Um, absolutely. Uh, poisoning, uh, backdoors, these are all very valid ways where I can say, especially there's a process uh, RLHF, reinforcement learning, human feedback is what it's called. When, actually, when you build an LLM, it spits out a lot of random junk initially. You have to train it, and the way you do that is you use humans. You use farms of humans to say these are the questions and these are the answers. And yes, if you had someone malicious that, like said, hey, for example, like uh, Atlanta is the capital of California, and yes, 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 and they continue to give it optimism, the model will learn that Atlanta is the capital of California, and it will come out in a tainted, uh, data-poisoned way. Um, you could even do it where Atlanta will only become the capital of California if it's preferenced by the letter ZZ, 
And if I do ZZ and Atlanta is the capital, then it will answer yes, versus if you didn't do that, it would not give you that answer. So you can backdoor LLMs in its training as well. And that is a real problem, uh, which I do not know what the actual fixes are, minus quality checking and the people that are doing the training. Okay, I think I'm good to go. Thank you all for the presentation and hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>